Who needs photo filters when you can use language to filter reality itself? Do you remember secret messages like this one? I feel like they always showed up on things like cereal boxes or fast food toys. There was some kind of text hidden by a messy red pattern, and then you could use a red piece of transparent plastic to reveal the secret message. Of course, it works because of the way that the red plastic filters light. All the red light passes through without any trouble, meaning that the red and white areas of the secret message look basically the same. That reduces the visual noise that otherwise obscures the words in blue ink, making the message immediately more legible. It's a cool trick, but we're not really here to talk about decoder rings or secret messages or marketing to children. No, we're here to talk about the sometimes vexing relationship between language and reality. More specifically, we're talking about Kenneth Burke's insight into that relationship, which he wrote about in an essay called Terministic Screens. Not only are terministic screens an important concept in rhetorical theory, but they're also based on something pretty similar to these secret messages, so let's get right to it. Near the beginning of his essay, Burke writes, when I speak of terministic screens, I have particularly in mind some photographs I once saw. They were different photographs of the same object, the difference being that they were made with different color filters. Here, something so factual as a photograph revealed notable distinctions in texture and even in form, depending on which color filter was used for the documentary description of the event being recorded. So even as we can see here right now, when you filter light in different ways, you'll see different things. And that's not just to say that everything will be tinted with one color or another. Because the filters only let one wavelength of light through, they end up removing a lot of the information that might otherwise reach our eyes, which influences our perception of the things that we're seeing. Of course, Burke was writing long before hashtag no filter would have even made sense, so for him, the idea that a photograph could be so easily manipulated caught his attention. And he seems to have figured that language relates to reality in much the same way, and he called that phenomenon terministic screens. The basic idea is that language, by its very nature, filters out certain things about the world, which ultimately influences the kinds of observations that we can make about the world. And in the same way that choosing a different color filter will result in a different photograph, choosing a different set of terms may lead to a different worldview. As Burke argues that terminology affects our view of the world, he explains it by saying, I have in mind simply the fact that any nomenclature necessarily directs the attention into some channels rather than others. So this isn't some wild idea that language can control or alter the thoughts that you're capable of having, just that certain sets of language will direct your attention in particular ways to particular things. For example, I took a class on poetic forms once, and I learned all about anapests and dactyls, catalexis, accentual verse and trochaic inversion. I was steeped in a whole system of poetic terms, and because I had words for those things, I naturally got much better at noticing them in different contexts. Similarly, after a few years of studying rhetoric, I had gotten used to hearing and using the phrase rhetorical construct to describe concepts and phenomena that affect society. Then, not long ago, I was talking to a friend who was studying sociology, and she used the phrase social construct to describe something that I was getting ready to call a rhetorical construct. I can't remember exactly what we were talking about, but I was struck by how our differences in education had led us to call the same thing by different names. We were more or less on the same page the whole time, but her sociological terms had influenced her to pay more attention to the social dynamics of the situation, while my rhetorical terms had influenced me to be more sensitive to the ways that discourse and persuasion were at work in the same instance. That is, my rhetorical terms had screened out a lot of the social information about what we were talking about in the same way that a red filter can make all the reds seemingly disappear from a secret message. So my friend and I were both looking at reality and observing things that were true, but the differences in our observations were conditioned by the differences in the terms that we were using. But Burke then expands on the screening effect of terms like this. Not only does the nature of our terms affect the nature of our observations, in the sense that the terms direct the attention to one field rather than to another, also, many of the observations are but implications of the particular terminology in terms of which the observations are made. In brief, much that we take as observations about reality may be but the spinning out of possibilities implicit in our particular choice of terms. And that's significant, and it goes back to what we see when we look at photographs that have been taken with different filters. See, a photograph, at least in Berg's day, was reliably objective, an accurate representation of reality. 
a filtered photograph is still true, still objective in a sense, because it doesn't add anything to the image. Everything that you can see in a filtered image is also visible in an unfiltered reality. But a filter does remove certain things. So the true objective reality that you see in a filtered photo isn't the same objective reality you might see in an unfiltered one. And one of the ways that Booth illustrates this idea is by comparing evolutionary and theological understandings of humankind. Now, before we get into it, I do for some reason feel like it's worth saying that we shouldn't get too hung up on trying to decide which of the two sides is correct. Burke isn't weighing in on either side, he's just using the different viewpoints as a way to understand how terministic screens work, and that's what we're doing too. The goal is to understand a rhetorical concept, not, of course, to settle a centuries-long discussion. Anyway, Burke points out that, unsurprisingly, evolutionary biology uses different terms from those used in theology. You know, for example, one uses the term God with all of its implications, and the other doesn't with all of the implications that come from that. And these different terminologies set up different terministic screens, which filter perceptions in different ways, ultimately leading to significantly different interpretations of reality. He writes, for instance, Darwin sees only a difference of degree between man and other animals, but the theologian sees a difference in kind. That is, the set of terms, including natural selection, fitness, and genetics, tends to filter out evidence of the fundamental differences between humans and animals, whereas the set of terms, including creation, spirit, and eternity, tends to filter out the fundamental similarities between humans and animals. So, like with our secret messages, a theologian's terministic filter makes the differences between animals and humans so clear and obvious that the similarities seem to disappear in comparison. And likewise, Darwin's terministic filter suppresses the differences so strongly that he really can only see the similarities. As a result, Darwin concludes that humans are essentially animals at a particular stage of their evolution, while theologians see humans as fundamentally distinct from other animals, a different kind of creature entirely. So while our terministic screens may just nudge us to pay more attention to some things rather than others, it's also true that what we are willing to observe in the first place can be influenced by the terms that we choose. That is, once we've committed to terms, we have, to a certain extent, committed to a particular worldview as well. But it's important to remember that terministic screens are fundamentally limitations. Burke writes that even on the purely secular level, Darwin overstated his case, and as a consequence, in his stress upon the continuity between man and the other animals, he unduly slighted the evidence for the discontinuity here. He then goes on to say, we don't need theology, but merely the evidence of our characteristic socio-political disorders to make it apparent that man is, alas, something special. In other words, it's just not the case that evolutionary terminology provides a purely objective and comprehensive view of humanity. There are a lot of things about humans that those terms just can't address, and that's true of every terminology. Burke says any definition of man in terms of specialized scientific nomenclatures would necessarily be over-socialized, or over-biologized, or over-psychologized, or over-physicized, or over-poeticized, and so on depending on which specialized terministic screen was being stretched to cover not just its own special field, but a more comprehensive area. So every terminology from every specialized field functions as a screen, suppressing some facts about the world and bringing others into sharper contrast. Apply a good screen in the wrong situation, and it's going to distort your view of reality. So it's not about finding a perfect terministic screen that provides a purely objective view of reality. It's about finding the right set of terms for the right job. It might seem a little claustrophobic to say that we can't get away from terministic screens and that they're always influencing our perceptions of reality, but it's really not something to worry about. The fact that terministic screens exist is actually really useful. We just need to make sure that we understand them well so that we can make better use of them. And that takes us right back to the secret messages we started with. Without a color filter, it's basically impossible to read the message. The fact that a red filter seems to remove extraneous information is a really useful thing that makes it easier to read the blue text. Similarly, the specialized terminology of biology is really useful in particular contexts. It would be really hard to know very much about cells at all without terms like mitochondria, phospholipid, or meiosis. But a red light filter isn't useful in every case. If we had a secret message written in red on a blue background, 
we'd be sunk with just a red filter. And in the same way, the deterministic screens that come with biology won't do you much good if you're trying to understand opera. So, like all things rhetorical, it's important to remember that deterministic screens are context sensitive and that we'll always be better served by understanding our situations and our options than by over committing to our favorite set of terms. Like Burke points out, even the behaviorist who studies man in terms of his laboratory experiments must treat his colleagues as persons rather than purely and simply as automata responding to stimuli. So despite the clear and useful scientific knowledge that comes from screens that show human behavior being influenced by external forces, Burke argues that that's not really a great way to get along with coworkers. For that, a different set of terms will be more useful and more personable. And that's the point. We ought to take advantage of biology's terministic screens when we're discussing biology and of poetry's terministic screens when we're discussing poetry. Those specialized vocabularies were designed to do specific jobs, and it would be crazy not to use them in those situations. But it's also important to recognize that every terministic screen filters out important information. We can't just pick one and stick with it in every situation, so it's worth developing an awareness of the terms that we're using and the ways that they're coloring our perceptions of reality. Because they all do, and we're in trouble if we pretend that they don't. Besides that, it's good to become familiar with a wide array of different terminologies. If we look at the world through only one filter, we're bound to miss important things about the world that we live in. But if we get good at seeing through various filters, we'll be able to catch things that we might otherwise miss. So a theologian might never fully agree with the strongest form of the evolutionary worldview, but it would be a mistake to completely ignore the vocabulary of evolution and all of the realities that it can highlight. At the very least, I can't help but think that we'd all be better off if we all got better at recognizing that our perceptions of the world are mediated by the terminologies that we've adopted, and that we're all getting limited, filtered views of reality that are different from those of the people around us. We're in a much better position to work around our disagreements when we understand what's really at the root of them, and often, it might just be that different terministic screens are what's causing all the trouble. So that's terministic screens in some kind of a nutshell. I know that I had a great time talking about it, but that could also be because I just had fun playing with the colored filters. Either way, it's always good to have you along, and I hope that you learned something interesting or useful. If so, maybe share it with a friend, or feel free to leave your questions down below. While you're doing that, I'll keep messing around with these filters. Take your time, and I'll see you again real soon. Oh, that one's nice. That one's pretty good. I don't know, how's that one? Oh, not bad, not bad, maybe okay. you. Yeah, that's okay. This one? I don't know. Back to that one. We'll have to see.